Amen. As we continue on in our series working through Old Testament book, an account, the story of the life of Ezra, I had an interesting thoughts this week as I was reading through chapters 4, 5, and 6, and really even more so even this morning, I started thinking about the oddest thing. I started thinking about what I like to call universal truths of everyday life for Brad Kirby. That's what I started thinking of. I wanted to call them kind of what I call just for me. I assume they were just for me, inevitabilities of life. Things that in my life, I would look around and say, I don't know if they were for everybody else, but things that seem to happen always to me with a regularity. And I ended up going on Google. I ended up going on the internet and being like, I wonder if this is just me or if this happens to other people. Found out that maybe I'm not the only one. And, and I made a whole list of things that the way I'd word it is, when I say universal truths, these are things that in my life at least that I've come to just expect. I, I just know that these are, this is how my life goes. It could be the most smallest thing. I started to just think of things like standing in line uh, or being stuck in traffic. And here's the universal truth for my life. Whatever line of traffic I'm in or whatever line I'm in at the grocery store, the other one is the one that moves, okay? So this is a universal truth. This is what I'm trying to say. I think about my life, and as soon as I shift lanes, man, I know I'm not the only one who, who experiences universal truth. If I get in the lane, it's going to stop for some reason. I don't even know what the rationale is. Just stay in the lane you're in, and neither one's going to go anywhere. I started thinking about dropping stuff. In my life, whenever I drop a plate of food, it is, it's mathematically impossible, but it happens in my life. If I drop a plate of food and it has a piece of pie on it or a piece of toast or a, a piece of cake, you would think that I'd have a 50-50 shot of it landing plate side down, but it never does. It's always going to ruin the food. It's always going to drop with the messy side down, and I'm that kind of brother I'm not even ashamed to admit. I always ask my second question, how clean is this floor? That's what I always think. That's a good piece of pie, man. People starve, and we can't let that go to waste. I start thinking about dropping other things. In my house, if I drop something that is hard, it's some kind of inanimate object. You drop it in my house, it, it's got a mind of its own. It's going to roll to the most inaccessible spot in the house. It will get there underneath the lazy boy. If I drop something next to my car, guaranteed, nine times out of ten, it's going to roll to the exact center of the bottom of the automobile. I have to army crawl to get it out of there. And you're like, hey, you can't plan that kind of stuff. It's inevitable. Start looking at all kinds of other things. If I lose something, I go through the normal process of looking for it, hunting for it. It'd be weeks. It might turn into a month. I get to that point where I've lost it. I'm thinking, man, it's gone. It's gone forever. I'll never find it to the point where I'm like, I'm going to have to go spend the money to buy another one. In my life, nine times out of ten, that's the moment where I have purchased a new phone or whatever it is that I find the other item. That happens in my life. I mean, go on and on. I think about my car. If I have a broke appliance or a broke claw, a car, it will not run. I cannot get it to do anything. At the moment I take it to the repair place, at the moment I take it to the repairman, it's going to run like a champ. Cannot get it to do what, I, what I, it, it has been doing. I mean, I could go on and on. I, I, with this one, the 50-50-90 theory is, is what I've heard it called. And, and I agree with this. If there's, you know, it was like when I was taking tests as a kid in school. And you've got a 50-50 guess for anything in life. 90% of the time in my life, that guess is going to be wrong. That's what I call it. 50-50-90. These are things in my life that I started thinking about that I'm like, you would think after 43 years that I wouldn't be shocked that these things happen anymore. And I think of those things, as funny as they might be, because when I read through chapters 4, 5, and 6, let me tell you what we see. We see a universal truth for Christians. We see it in chapters 4, 5, and 6. And here's what it is. Sometimes we don't want to hear this universal truth. It may not be super encouraging. It is true. We do need to pay attention to it because here's what we begin to see, the universal truth in chapters 4, 5, and 6. If a Christian, if a church dares to do what I'm asking us to do, looking ahead for the vision that God has for our church. If we were to dare to start obeying God, living His commands, living His statutes, living for the Lord, living the life of an actual obedient disciple, here is the universal truth you can mark it down. Not nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten, you will be attacked, accused, and you will be opposed. It'll happen. And I'm talking about who will that happen for? Not just people who say they're a Christian, not just people who, who go to church. I'm talking about people who have the audacity to go and actually live it out. Guaranteed 100% of the time, you'll be, you'll be attacked, you'll be accused, you'll be opposed. It's what we begin to see here, just as a whirlwind tour to catch you up on the first three chapters. I'm actually going to do something a little different than I would even planned all week. It's the second time in a month. This never happens to me, and now it's happening twice in a month. 
I'm going to cover these chapters. I'm going to do it a little bit different. My goal was to look at this. I want to show you in chapters 4 through 6 that this is exactly what happens to these people. God gives them a call. He stirs the spirit of the leaders. They're coming back to, to do a work that God's called them to do. He's going to take it and, and unpack each section of the Scripture. What I'd rather do is I just want to take you through the big story of what's happening in chapters 4 through 6. And I would ask you to go read it all for yourself later if you haven't done that. And I want us to see the truth that's found in these in the account of what's happening to the people of God as they return and this opposition that they face in chapters 4 through 6. And I want to look at how, what we do with that. I want to more spend some time probing into what do we do with this opposition. I want to make sure we have time to do that. And so let me just give you the whirlwind tour. What do we see in the first three chapters just by way of a reminder? We see after 70 years of exile to Babylon because the people of God had decided that they were bored with God. That's what we learned last week. They were bored with worship, bored with God so much so that they wanted to follow other gods, created gods, earthly gods. God said, okay, you want that? You want the gods of Babylon? Go and have it. I'm going to put you in there for 70 years. And now we find ourselves as we come to Ezra in the first three chapters, and they're coming back. And they're coming back to do a lot of these rewords. They're coming back. They're returning for restoration. They are not only rebuilding the altar and rebuilding the foundations of the temple and rebuilding the temple, they, they are also rebuilding their faith in God. That's what we see in these first three chapters. God is returning to them, not only a return to the true God, but a, a now new return and revival, a, a new vision for a fervency in worship, in a return to the word, in a return to the work of God. As we saw at the very end of chapter 3, a return to being a public witness for God in their, in their nation and in their land. This is what we see happening in the first three chapters of Ezra. And I love, I love the end of Ezra chapter 3. What do we see? That their, that their shouts of joy and their witnessing and their worship were, as verse 13 said, heard far away. And I think it is because of that. What a perfect transition to this opposition that we see in chapter 4. If we have the audacity to live in a way that people will notice, they didn't sneak back into the land. I mean, they were sobbing, weeping, shouting, building. Everyone could hear it far away. And because of that, yes, I'm sure there were people who heard it and they saw it and they thought, man, that's amazing. Maybe there were some people who said, man, we need to be a part of these people of God. But let me tell you who else heard it. And we see it already in the first verse of chapter 4. Their enemies. Their adversaries. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, now when the adversaries, they're in the, in the Hebrew, it also is a perfect word for enemies of Judah and Benjamin, heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you. For we worship your God, that's a lie, as you do, and we've been sacrificing to him. Let me see, what do we already see happening here in chapter four? Because they had the audacity to return, because they had the audacity to uh, recommit themselves to his word, to worship, to the work of God, and to the public witness of God's glory, what did it cause them to do? Right here in very subtle, a subtle form, veiled form, what do we begin to see even in the very first two verses of chapter 4? Opposition. And here's what I would call it. It's, it's going to be a little different than your notes because I'm going to take a little different approach, but you already see this opposition of what? Opposition of compromise. That's the first tactic here in the first five verses of Ezra chapter 4. You have people, the enemies and the adversaries say, we don't like this. We don't want the temple to be built. We don't worship. We want worship for the God of Israel. We don't want worship here for, for the temple of the Lord. And so what's our first tactic? It's not to go in there with a sword. It's not to go in there with guns. It's not to go in there with physical violence. It's to go in there with scheming, craftiness cunning in order to maybe instead of just going in there and trying to knock down the work that they're doing, our first strategy would be going there with compliments. Go in there with, with seeming cooperation in order to gain influence to stop the work from happening from inside out. I mean, you'll go and you'll read. I want you to go back and read this. I want you to do a little study on this, but this is what you begin to see. An attack to cause this work of God to compromise. Let me tell you something. If if 
We are going to be the church that fulfills the vision that God is giving us and fulfills the Great Commission. Let me tell you what we better expect that we're going to have opposition. And we ought to expect that this same kind of opposition would occur in the church. And let me tell you why she would expect it. Because this kind of opposition is already working in the church. If you were to ask me to describe the church of Jesus Christ in our country and in our world today... One of the words, some of them would be great, but one of the words I think we would have to use to describe it would be that it is increasingly a compromised church. I think the church has bought the subtle, crafty, scheming lies of the enemy over the last 20, 30 years to treat the church like a business. And that our goal is to Make money. Our goal is to fill seats. And I think pastors have fallen under such pressure to do that that we compromise God's standards and his ways in the church. Boy, the enemy knew what he was doing here. He knew that these people had returned and they were in a very tender, delicate political situation. You know that they were already kind of nervous, like we know we got people around us that don't like us. And now they're coming to us and saying they want to help us. They want to, they want to be friendly to us. I don't want to burn bridges. I want to be a good neighbor. I don't want to upset people. You would think the tendency would be like, man, let's take them up on this. What a great offer. But you look at it. I know it sounds harsh, but it was the right response from Zerubbabel. It was very harsh, very strict. No, you're not going to be a part of this work. Because what did he know? He knew that they weren't worshiping Yahweh. He knew that they weren't interested in, in glorifying the Lord. They knew that it wasn't about the Lord's work here in Rebuilding the Temple. It was about compromise. It was about gaining power. It was about gaining influence here. Let me tell you what. Those kind of things happen today in the church. If I were to look at the church today, there are plenty of churches who are compromising. Where does it start? With the Word of God. Maybe, just maybe, we don't want... We don't want to make the world angry. People will stop coming to church. So let's swerve around a couple tender issues in the word. Let's shrink back. Let's not preach the whole counsel of the word. Let's not talk about God's standards for sexuality. Might upset some people in the world. Let's not talk about God's standards for marriage. That might upset some people. Matter of fact, let's just change his standards. We don't want to be called names. I don't want to upset people. They, what if they leave the church? Because we've made God people fill in the, the seats. We want to do it our way. We want to run it like a business. Then we start compromising standards and other things. We start comp compromising our standards for leaders. And when you compromise the word of God, everything's on the table to be compromised. If the word's not going to be our standard, then what is? The world. Now we'll start letting people in the church look just simple things. Let me tell you something that's dying in the church of Jesus Christ today is biblical church membership. Regenerate church membership. I know it sounds like a very churchy thing to talk about. It is important. I think we've lost sight of that. It's impossible for me to do my job without real biblical regenerate church. Who am I responsible to shepherd? Every Christian in a five-mile radius that comes to our church on Sunday morning? How do we hold people accountable? How do we know what people believe? We have churches. Oh, by the way, I would say we need to look at ourselves first before we start talking about every other church. We have churches letting people teach their kids and teach their classes who have not become members of the church. And we say, what's the point? What's the point if we're going to background check people physically before we let them have access to our people and our, and our church and our congregation? Then let me tell you what, we ought to have a spiritual background check that says we agree on doctrine, we agree on theology, that there is some level of accountability before I give you access to the people of God and let you come in to be a part of the work. My God ought to know what you believe. God's going to hold me accountable for that. Church membership needs to be important, that we have an agreement on what we believe. We put you in a position where you're visible in the choir. We put you in a place where you're visible in a teaching role. We put you in a place of visibility in the church. Let me tell you what. Then my children and everybody else's children would assume that we're giving them a platform to go ask them questions. I need to know what they're going to say to people that come to our church. If we take roles that God gave us roles in the church of deacon, elder, teacher, 
Look, there's grace for us and mercy there, but we need to take those calls seriously. I think we live in a world that has compromised these things. We look at the church today, and church has turned into just a pep rally. There's very little accountability, very little standards, a weakening of the Word of God, and we wonder why the church is disintegrating from the inside out. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish the church from the world because we've let the world in. These people were offering their help, but they were not worshipers of Yahweh. These idolaters wanted to have a stake in the temple, not so they could really help build it, because they wanted influence in it. And so what Zerubbabel knew is if they adopted the practice of their enemies in a desperation to appease their enemies and win the battle... Had they really defeated their enemies at all? If Israel allows their adversaries and their enemies to be a part of the work of building the temple, they might as well not build the temple at all. There was opposition. There was opposition to compromise. And let me tell you what we see as we move on through, though. As we move through this passage of Scripture, you begin to see another kind of compromise that we see here. We see another kind of compromise as as we move on even to verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4. What do we see? We see a compromise and an opposition of accusation. So now we we move on from a veiled opposition. Now you have veiled opposition that's subtle. and, And if that doesn't work and they tell me I can't make them compromise from the inside out, let me tell you what will always happen. What's the next logical step? We're just going to get it more public with this. Now we'll just let our real intentions be known. We'll move on from just trying to oppose you with compromise and compliments. We'll now try to oppose you with accusations. You begin to see this. Look at verse 6 and 7 of chapter 4. It says, And in the reign of Ahasuerus, and in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. They wrote a letter that was written in Aramaic, and it was translated. What did all these local governors, they tried to be a part of the work because they wanted to sabotage it from the inside out. That didn't work, so what did they do? They said, we're going to start making accusations to the the big leaders. And, oh, by the way, when you get to verses 6 and 7, he kind of fast-forwards ahead here. He's fast-forwarding ahead to another kind of an opposition that Nehemiah and them experienced when they were building the walls. He's just showing you all of the opposition that happened for Ezra, all that happened for Nehemiah. All of these local leaders got together, and here's what they did. They said, let's just write a letter. And some of it might have even somewhat been based in truth, but they started making up accusations against God's people, all kind of accusations. Go read it for yourself. They're, they're going to cost us money. These people are bad for the economy. Let me tell you something. The church ought to be prepared to be losing things like nonprofit status. not sure that's not even a, a bad thing. These people, they they don't love the king. They love Yahweh more than the king. How dare they? This is an accusation they made. They started talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem's what? It's a place of rebellion. It's a place of harm. It's a place of revolts. And so what did those accusations and the opposition do? It caused Artaxerxes to put out a decree to stop the building and stop the work. Let me tell you what, I've already seen it. I've seen it in the last two, three, four years. For whatever cunning scheme of the enemy for the world around us to put out decrees to tell the church to stop gathering, to stop meeting, to stop teaching, to stop preaching. There's going to be opposition for compromise. There's going to be opposition that comes in the form of accusation. I think we look at chapters 5 and 6. You got to go read it. Then it just turns into absolute opposition through intimidation. I mean, you look at the beginning of chapter 5 and it says that the prophets who were responding to a word of God through them, instructed the people, in spite of the opposition, in spite of decrees, in spite of the intimidation, in spite of the compromise, here's what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to go ahead and build anyway. Do the work. We're not waiting for a decree and a letter to come from Darius and Cyrus. We're not doing that. We know what God said. Everybody's saying, we need to wait until we clear up this matter. No, 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 no. God has given us a command to do this work, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right now. And what was their response? Who authorized you to do this? That's the first question they ask. And look at the second question. We want names. Give us the names of the people who are involved in this. Give us the names of the people doing this intimidation. We're going to make your name known. We're going to put it up on Facebook. We're going to threaten your livelihood. We'll threaten your income. 
Will doxia, it was Old Testament doxing. Our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who have the audacity to once have been Jews who said we believe in the Messiah. Guess what's happened to them today? They hardly can attend worship without people throwing rocks at them. Pictures of their families are put on posters around town to tell people do not hire these people. It was a part of a church. Our whole mission was to go and work with Messianic Jews so that we could teach them trades to take care of their own because they were ostracized from the community and the world. They were being intimidated because they had the audacity to believe and fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ in their life and in their community. And that's a whirlwind tour. That's a whirlwind tour of chapters 4 through 6. And, and here's what it begins to tell us. All one thing, all of what we've already seen. Opposition can and will happen today if we dare to serve the Lord. If we dare to step ahead here, as flawed as we are, and say, God, show us a vision, and we are going to be dead set on being people of courage and obedience to go live it out. One of the things that we ought to go ahead and set in our mind and in our reminder right now is that we ought to have an expectation that opposition in all sorts of form will come inside and outside of the church. I mean, the Bible warns us repeatedly, don't worry about getting all this. You can go back and watch the video. I mean, I don't know why sometimes Christians are so surprised at the reality of persecution. Why Christians are so surprised. They were in Peter's day. He would say, I don't know why you're surprised at these fiery trials, as if we didn't know this was supposed to be happening to us. I mean, Jesus repeatedly warns us about the... Not the possibility, but the reality of persecution. And he tells us in John 18, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. I mean, look at Paul in 2 Timothy. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Matthew, it's blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad. Great is your reward in heaven. Matthew 5, it goes on to say, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Listen to Peter. Have a good conscience in 1 Peter 3. So that when you are slandered, those who revile you, revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And we go on and on and on. Listen to, to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. 1 John 3, 13. Do not be surprised, brothers, when the world hates you. I know it's not encouraging, but it seems as if in God's word that he is going to great lengths to warn his people to be alert, to be watchful, to be ready, to be prepared for persecution and hatred in this world. Here's what we should know, and this is what I want us to get. If you don't hear me say anything else, you haven't heard me already, and you haven't heard me, and you won't hear me on the way out, is that we should know that the life of a real disciple who has faith in Christ Jesus is a life of warfare. Every day that we get up and you leave your room, and you have the audacity to leave your home, even before you leave your home, battle, that's what awaits you. I read a stat like a decade ago that said, I forget who it was, he was either Lifeway or Barna, and they surveyed people that were walking out of church services, Protestant church services in our country, and they asked them two very simple questions. Do you believe in God was the first question. And you'd be shocked to know that 95% of those people said, yes, I believe in God. They asked them a second question. Do you believe in Satan? Only 60% of the same people said yes. Let me tell you what I think about when I hear that stat. The enemy loves that. He would love it if we walked out of here and we got up every day and we just wanted to pretend like he didn't exist it's hard to fight somebody. It's hard to work against his schemes. It's hard to be alert when you want to pretend like they're not real. He would love that. Nobody's opposing him. Nobody's fighting the fight. Nobody's going to war. This is the enemy's tactics and strategies. And yet, what do we see? Even more so, not only is there a reality that we are going to be persecuted, there's an expectation in Scripture over and over again that we ought to be active in resisting it. Let me tell you some of the, the scriptures that we see. I can go to 1 Timothy 1, and this is what Paul was warning his young ministry student. He says, what should we be doing? We should wage good warfare. 1 Timothy 6 says that we ought to fight the good fight of faith. I go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, share in the suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, not getting entangled in civilian pursuits. 
I go to Revelation 2, as, as you see the, John, and he's sitting here, he's having these visions. He says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Think about 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you rejoice that now for a little while, which that little while there is all of this life, is the little while. If necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fire awaits us. Trial awaits us. Suffering awaits us. Hatred awaits us. What do we do? Sit back and take it? What do we do? Sit back and be intimidated? What do we do? Sit back and compromise? No. Fight. Fight. It's hard to fight when you're not paying attention. It's hard to fight when you don't know a battle's going on. So here's what I want to do with our time. I wanted to make sure that we used our time to look at a couple things. What do we do with it? That's what I wanted to do. More than just describe how the enemy works, more than just describe what happened here thousands of years before Christ, I want to just look at two more things and we'll be done this morning. I just want to kind of look at how the enemy works today. And I want to show you that from Scripture. He's working. I mean, John 10.10 says that we have life and we have it to the full, but at the same time, here's what we can bank on, that we have an, an enemy and he's coming to kill, steal, destroy. He's still at work today. I mean, he's prowling, 1 Peter 5.8, like a roaring lion prowling around looking for somebody to devour and eat up, looking for churches, looking for Eastwood. I think there's a lot of churches say, let's just be quiet and he'll pass us by. We have the audacity to go out there and start screaming with joy until we're heard far away. Guess what? Lion will be at the door looking around for how to destroy us and devour us and eat us. How does the enemy work today? Well, he works the same way he's been working. I mean, look at Scripture. Just give you an overview. How does what is Satan's primary mode of operation? Lying, lies. I mean, John eight forty four says he's the father of them, the originator of it. it says in, in in that same verse, John eight forty four, he has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. He lies. He wants to lie to us. He wants us to believe things that are false wants us to do hermeneutical gymnastics with the Word of God and twist it to say what we want to say instead of what God wants it to say. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Satan likes to blind the minds of unbelievers. So as we go out there and we've got a mission that's going to be outward, go and share the gospel and to hold out the word of truth, at the very same time we have the enemy and he is working to put blinders over the eyes of unbelievers. As 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. What does he do? One of the strategies is to disguise himself as an angel of the light. How is he going to blind them? How is he going to come with his lies? Well, it's not going to be obvious. That's what we see in Scripture. I used to tell my youth all the time, you know, it's not like the enemy. I think he wants to use all kinds of things to destroy your life. Would love to you to go to college and destroy your life with alcohol or some substances or drugs. And he's never going to come to you and say, hey, look, let me fly a banner over your life that says, hey, go ahead and, and indulge in all of these things to excess and to the point where it destroys your life because it'll just destroy your life. He's not going to do that. What would he do? He's going to put a little umbrella in your fruity, fruity little drink and tell you, man, no problem. This is great. The whole world does it. Have fun. Deceptive. What does that scripture tell us in 2 Corinthians 11? Man, he's going to come in, going to make himself look good. This looks right. I can go find Bible scholars that'll tell me what I'm doing is right. We can twist it any way we want to. He's a master of doing this kind of thing. He's doing it now. Says that he's a master in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, that he's a master in false signs and wonders. Puts on a good show. Says the coming of the lawless one is by activity of Satan. With all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. He's a master of tempting people to sin, according to Scripture. 2 Corinthians 11 3, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a seared seer and a pure devotion in Christ Jesus. This is his main work. How can I pry you away from a pure devotion in Christ Jesus? I'll do anything I gotta do to do it. He works too, according to Mark chapter 4, according to Mark 4, 15, he works to remove God's word from people. Ooh, if there was a number one attack on the church today, let me tell you where it is going to begin and where it is going to end on the authority of God's word. You want to kill a church from the inside out? 
Let them buy the belief that they don't need this word. That the word no longer has to be their authority. You let the church believe that it's not inerrant and not inspired and not God's authoritative word to us then all kinds of sin and disobedience is on the table. If God's word is not going to be our standard, then we will. And that's not a good thing. It says here in Scripture, what does he do? He wants to remove this from you. wants to remove it from God's people. I mean, he says that in verse 15. Satan immediately, what did he do with these seeds of word of God that were sown? Some falls on this path and the birds quickly take it away is what Jesus was giving this analogy In Mark chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, Why were they taken away? Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which was sown in them. Satan snatches the word. Why? Because he hates faith. And he knows that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. I mean, we could go on and on. He's a murderer. He's a liar. It says in Scripture that he makes war specifically against missionaries and mission work. Here, we prayed to send somebody out last week. Let me tell you what she ought to expect. Opposition. 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 and 18. We endeavored the more eagerly, with great desire, Paul was saying, to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. Why couldn't we? Because Satan hindered us. He's working. He's scheming. He ain't sleeping. He ain't clocking out. Zealous to work against God, to work against the church. Tried everything he could with Jesus. Even death on the cross couldn't stop him. So what will he do until Jesus returns? Turn his attention on the bride of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to end with very quickly. In an interesting place, and this is really the part where I kind of change where I was going to end. What do we do? So we know he attacks. We know we're going to have opposition. How do we fight that battle? And here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to go to a very interesting passage of Scripture. I want you to go all the way back to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 2. I love this account in the Bible. It's probably my favorite Old Testament story because it is so random, but it is good. And I would guarantee that there's going to be a lot of people you've never even heard of this Bible character before. And it's good. And in this account, here's what we're going to discover. Not so much how we fight our battles. I think this scripture is good for us this morning. I want to end with it because I think it's going to show us how not to. You want to know how to get up from your pew and how to get up from your seat today, knowing that this opposition is coming, that it's already at work, that we have an enemy, and you want to know how to go lose? I'm about to show you how to lose your battle every single day. We find it right here in 2 Samuel, just a a whirl, whirlwind tour of what's happening here. At the end of 1 Samuel, what happens? Saul and David are playing this cat and mouse game. David's running away from Saul. Saul dies at the end of 1 Samuel. He's surrounded by the Philistines, and he asks his sword bearer to kill him. His sword bearer says, I'm not going to do it. So he falls on his own sword, and then they have his way with his body and lop his head off and all that good stuff. And so by the time we come to 2 Samuel, in the very first chapter, there's a civil war, so to speak, for the people of God and the nation of Israel. And the two sides, you need to understand this. The two sides you have over here, people are thinking, well, I know who should take over the king. It should be Saul's lineage, a man named Ish-bosheth. And the commander of his army was a man named Abner. And over here, you have God's man. You have God's leader over Judah. This is who God says is going to lead his people, and it's this man named David. And the commander of his army is a man named Joab. Now, here's the setting for the story that I'm about to read to you. They meet at this place that shows up repeatedly in the Old Testament called the Pool of Gibeon. Fascinating place. We've actually found this place in 1957. It's in one of the ancient architectural marvels of the world. 88 to 100 feet deep in limestone, they cut this circular base all the way down to the water table. To this day, you can still get on stairs and walk all the way down there to the water. They met at this place, and instead of having all of their soldiers have an all-out war, they picked 12 for this side. 12 for this side. It was like football. I mean, it's football season starting here. I want you to know this. They they pick out their sides. And just before we read the scripture, you're picking out your 12. You're picking your best. I mean, you're you're not going to go get the weaklings. You get 12, you're going to pick the guys who know the weapons the best, strongest, the fastest, the smartest. That's who you're picking. This is what is about to happen here. And then I don't know how they started this. I don't know if they blew a horn or whistle, whatever happened. They just go. Everybody else sat back and ate popcorn. I don't know. This is what's happening here. Look at this with me, starting in verse 12. Here's the account of what happens here. It says, Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, and the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. 
And Joab, the son of Zeriah, and the servants of David, went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. Very friendly for a battle. Let's have a competition. And Joab said, let them arise. Then they arose and passed over the number, twelve for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, and the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword into his opponent's side, so they fell down together. Therefore the place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is at Gibeon. And the battle was fierce that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Now listen to this. And three of the sons of Zariah were there. Joab, the commander of the army of David. Abishai, and here is this unbelievable random character, Asahel. Now, Asahel was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. There's some awesome Bible trivia for you. Fastest man in the Bible. This guy is fast as a deer. And Asahel pursued Abner, and as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Is that you, Asahel? And he answered, It is I. And Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore, listen to this. Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear so that the spear came out at his back. And he fell there and died. Most obvious statement in all of the Bible. (laughs) He fell and died. Where he was, and listen to this, and all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still. Can I just recap what we just saw there very quickly at the end here? They stand on the other side. And they look at the 12, 12 for the enemies, 12 for Saul, for Joab, and they line up over here, and one of the guys that's picked on this side is Asahel. And I know why he was picked, because this brother was fast. You may not be, he may not be the best with a sword, but you have to catch him. That'd be a good skill. I'll just be the last one standing. It's always a tactic when youth are playing dodgeball. The person who's last is really the person who's not good at dodgeball. They're just good at dodging it and standing in the back the whole time. And let me just tell you something. You got to give Asahel some stuff here. Not only was he talented, not only was he fast, not only did he have skill, he was the, br- the brother of the commander of the army who would have been the leader, who would have known how to use a weapon. But you got to give him this. He was dedicated. I mean, this brother looked across the pool before they blew the whistle and said, I want the commander of the army. That wouldn't have been what I would have done. I'd have looked at him and been like, there's that one with the limp. He's mine. Don't get him. The short one, the scrawny one. No, he looks over there and he says, give me the commander of their army. That's the one I want. And as soon as they blow the whistle, boom, he takes off. I think it's interesting that Abner's running away. I mean, somebody runs at you like a deer. You don't even have time to think. It's like, what? This guy's coming. I got to run. They start having a conversation. At some point, it dawns on Abner. He's running away from Asahel, and he turns around, and he's like, this guy doesn't have any weapons. He doesn't even have any armor on. He says, hey, can I give you a little advice while I'm running away? See these dead guys here? Why don't you stop, get their armor and weapon? Says that Asahel, dedicated. I'm not going to do it. No, I'm focused. I'm focused. I'm going to get them. Says that Asahel warns him again. Hey, let me get, bro, I'm I'm telling you, I'm about to kill you. Get a weapon. I'm not even going to be able to look your brother in the face. I'm going to kill an unarmed man. He says, I'm not doing it, not turning to the right, not turning to the left. Just, I am laser focused on my task ahead. Got to give it to him. And so what happened? In spite of the fact that he had skills, had resources, was one of the top 12, was unbelievably dedicated, knew what he wanted to do, was on the right side. Let me tell you the end of his story. He looked like a fool. What's the end of his story? Is that Abner did exactly what Abner said he was going to do. He took the blunt side of the spear. Probably didn't have enough time to be like, well, here he comes. Let me get it right. He took the spear and threw it so hard that the dull side went all the way through Asahel and came out of his back and he fell on the ground. I think it's important to see that everybody else fighting the battle came up and they looked at him. And let me tell you what they were probably thinking of Asahel. What other than this is gross, they were thinking, what a went into battle with no armor and no weapon. Now, here's what I would tell us as we come to an end here. I think we would want to have a tendency here at the very end to say, I would never. I'd never do that. That's ridiculous. Let me give you a warning. I think most Christians wake up every single day, step out of their bedrooms, get ready, shower, brush their teeth, go out into the world with no armor on. 
and no weapon. And wonder why we look like fools defeated every single day. Because the enemy, he's got weapons. I'll tell you what we ought to do. We ought to do what Ephesians 6 tells us to do. Be alert. Suit up. What do we do about it? Suit up, Ephesians 6 tells us to do, starting in that second half. Suit up. Put on the armor of God. Let me tell you what the armor of God is so we're not confused. What is the helmet of salvation and the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness? It's all Jesus. How does the enemy work? He lies. He'll lie to our brain. Put on the helmet of salvation in Christ Jesus. You know what he'll tell us? You can't do this work. Why? I don't even know if I'm saved. He'll lie to you. Put it on. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know what he'll do? We have an enemy who will lie to us and say, man, you can't be a part of this vision. You can't be a part of this mission. I know what you did yesterday. You're a scuzz bucket. You're worth nothing. No, 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 no. Don't let him come at your heart. Your identity isn't your sin anymore. Your identity is Christ Jesus. Put on the breastplate. Guard your heart. Remind yourself of who you are in Christ Jesus. Don't let him talk that noise to you. Put on the feet of of the gospel, fitted with the readiness to go share the gospel. Put on the belt of truth, which binds it all together. And then what do we do? Pick up the sword and remind yourself of the truth to defend yourself against the lies of the enemy. Church, let me tell you what, if we're going to have any chance, any chance of being the church that God's calling us to do and fulfilling this vision, number one, we better return to worship, better return to the word, we better return to the work, we better return to witnessing, and we better start suiting up for battle. Start with yourself. That's what I'm asking you to do to respond this morning. Maybe you come down to this altar and say, you know what? Ooh, I ain't ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Part of this 30 days has been designed for us to just start putting on the arm. Remind ourselves of who we are in Christ Jesus. Remind us of the promises that we've been given. Look, maybe you're here and you just, you've put your sword down. You wake up every day and if you, you might as well put your Bible. I used to have a, a friend of mine who would say, put your Bible in your door frame every day. That way if you step over it, you just made a decision to be like, I don't need it today. Well, let me tell you, if you make that decision, you're going to end up like Asahel. You'll be two things, dead meat. That's what you're going to be. Let me tell you about our church. I'm excited for it. If our church decides that we don't want to do this, we want to start getting real busy. We think we're going to go out in the world and do all these great things for Jesus, but we don't want to have a relationship with him. We ain't going to suit up for battle. We ain't going to put on the armor of Christ. We're not going to hold out the truth of God's word. We're not going to start doing that in our life every single day. We will be two things, dead meat. Maybe you come to this altar. You just come to this altar and say, God, I'm, I'm a sitting duck. Maybe you repent. Maybe you ask God to give you a hunger for his word. Maybe you come to the altar and you're just tired of getting beat up. Maybe you're tired of losing. Maybe you're tired of the enemy prowling around your mind and creating havoc and doubt, paranoia. Maybe you're tired of lowering our standards. Why not let today be a day of repentance? It's a wonderful thing. Why not come to the altar and say, God, I'm sorry for that. I don't want that anymore. And then stand up and do something about it. That's the point of repentance. Not feeling sorry for something that's changing your course. And stand up and say, it's time for me to get involved in the Word. Pastor Brad, can you help me know how to get going again, how to read? Can you show me a group of people who I can do this with? Yes. We're going to have any chance. These are the kind of things that we need to do. Let me pray for us, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and respond as the Lord leads you. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you for your word. Woo. God, we know we're in war. Thankful that you've given us everything we need, though. Everything we need for victory. Everything we need to move ahead. God, I pray that you would give us a conviction to pick it up. <laughs> to use it to fight. God, I pray in this time as we end our service that you would convict us to come and Come before you with honesty. God, maybe there's just some people here who, who enemies wreaking havoc on their heart, their mind. I pray that they'd come to one of our pastors, one of our, our counselors. Maybe just come to this altar, God, and for the first time in a long time, breathe a little bit, lay it down. Whatever it is, God, I pray your spirit move in this place and we would respond. I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.